When it comes to the kind of biology we'll be talking about from here to the end of the semester, basically a survey of animal organ systems, there are really three pieces that have to fit together in order for you to have the complete picture of whatever it is we're talking about. It might be a lung or a kidney or even the tiny units within the lungs. Let's zoom in on the alveoli. These are tiny spaces in contact with tiny blood vessels called capillaries that you need a microscope in order to see. Or in the case of kidneys, we might be talking about the whole kidney level. Think in terms of a wad of roughly a quarter pound of organ meat that fits nicely in the palm of your hand. This is a critically important organ for your physiology, and it's composed of millions of various microscopic functional units, which include bizarre little blood vessels known as glomeruli, which is where the blood gets pressure filtered in a manner very similar to espresso coffee. In thinking about organs and their functional units, you will need to zoom in and out from macro to micro quite often, but this is not the big challenge for most students. As I mentioned before, there are three pieces. The first piece I want you to have is pretty straightforward and obvious, and I call this the structure part. Largely a descriptive understanding of the actual physical or anatomical entity itself. You'll need to develop a good picture on both macro and micro scales. And it's entirely possible for a student to get bogged down in learning just the details of anatomical structure, maybe even reaching the point where you're so focused on the microscopic details of what the parts are and what they look like and how they fit together that you actually lose sight of the significance of the structure itself. And this would be no good. You can study a lung to death, and this would be useless unless you take into account what the lung actually does for you as an organism. And here's where the next piece fits in. So really, the only reason why we would even care about detailed descriptions of anatomical structures is their significance in physiological function. Function is the second piece. It's whatever has to happen physiologically by virtue of the structure in order for the body to be successful in living. The lung, for example, has an enormous interior surface area, an expanse equivalent to about one side of a single tennis court, where the airspace comes into close proximity with the blood running through the tiny pulmonary capillaries. Knowing this fact would be meaningless if it were not that the surface area were a feature of lung anatomy that's totally crucial for providing the gas exchange needed for the aerobic metabolism responsible for the bazillion ATP molecules that we produce every second. You see, I want you to understand the connection between the physiological function of meeting the body's need for gas exchange and the anatomical structural feature of the lung surface area. The anatomy is the means by which the physiological function is achieved. Structure is anatomy. Function is physiology. The two are interwoven and interdependent. Some people will hear this and ask if there's one that's more important than the other. Does structure drive function or is it the other way around? Which is the dog and which is the tail? On first glance, you might conclude that structure is in the driver's seat. Let's take the example of that one particular aspect of the human lung. There's about 70 square meters of surface area, as I said, about the same area that's on one side of a single tennis court. And this would be an important aspect of your lung's structure. And you could argue that this is what's responsible for the function of your meeting your body's needs for gas exchange. So maybe it's structure that drives function, but there's another way of looking at this. Ask yourself, how does that structure come about in the first place? In the case of the interior surface area of the lungs, why have a singles tennis court worth of surface area and not a doubles court or a soccer pitch? Or why have an interior surface area that is a lung at all? The human lung and its surface area, like all important anatomical structures in all animals have been shaped by natural selection over eons of the species history. In the case of our lungs, this stretches back to well before the origin of humans and even before the origin of mammals. Our lungs came about because our amphibian-like fish ancestors that were becoming more adapted to life on dry land needed an interior surface area for gas exchange with air to supplement and eventually supplant the use of gills, which had been used for gas exchange with water. In the time since, the surface area of our lungs has been driven upwards due to the greater need for gas exchange as our metabolic rates and our body sizes increased. For a typical sized human, 
Anything less than a singles tennis court would cost us in terms of fitness, whereas whatever benefit we might gain by having a doubles court is presumably not substantial enough to outweigh the costs of making such a lung. Here's where the third piece comes in, natural selection. Ultimately, it's the need for physiological function that drives the evolution of structure. If you and your singles tennis court sized lungs are sitting between two people with different sized lungs, maybe the guy on your right has a mini lung with a ping pong table's worth of surface area, and the guy to your left has an oversized lung that's way too big for what he needs. You can see that your fitness is greater than either of your neighbors. Your lung is the right size to meet your needs for gas exchange, and your rate of survival and reproduction will be predictably greater than either of your neighbors. Okay, so is it necessarily true that all anatomical structures have a physiological function? Why, actually, no. Remember that life changes through evolution, and a structure that's important for a species in one particular time might be totally useless for the descendants of that species living at a later time. Take, for example, the eyes on a blind cavefish that lives in total darkness. You may be aware that blind forms of life often evolve in caves. The fish are just one of many. There are also crickets and shrimp and salamanders, and all of these show varying degrees of reduction in eye structures, and many appear to be completely eyeless. Why is this important? Well, for one, it shows us very clearly that it's the function of sight, which is required for those of us living in the light, that causes the natural selection that maintains the continued existence of the anatomical structure of eyes. Function is required for structure. When you remove the need for function, in this case sight, the structure degenerates. How does this degeneration occur? Well, think of mutations that destroy eyesight but leave other bodily functions intact. These mutations would be harmful in a non-cave population and would be eliminated by natural selection. However, for a cave population living in perpetual darkness, these mutations could have no adverse effects at all, and they might even be a little bit beneficial. If you've ever had an eye infection, you know that in spite of all the wonderful things that eyes do for us, they are also a potential site of infection, and for a wild animal living with no access to medical treatment, any infection is potentially lethal. Thinking about it this way, having no eyes could actually give you a fitness advantage if for no other reason that it makes you immune to eye infections. Another thing about blind cavefish, one that has no eyes at all, is that it may very likely still have an ocular orbit. That's the eye socket in the skull. This would be an example of an anatomical structure with no physiological function whatsoever. There's no eye to go into the socket, so why should the socket exist? The answer here should be pretty obvious to you by now. This fish evolved quite recently from ancestors that did have eyes to go into those eye sockets. The mutations that resulted in the loss of external eyes would not have eliminated all the parts of the eye structure. So yeah, you might find ocular orbits in blind fish, as well as any number of other diddly bits of eye structures that still may be there but have no physiological significance. These are just what remains of the complex anatomical structure of the eye, which did until recently have physiological significance. It's like, a, it's like an earlier chapter of this fish's evolutionary history. Professor Lee Van Valen had a special name for these structures. He called them ghosts of selection past. Most biologists call them vestiges or vestigial structures. And while these structures are largely useless, that is, without function, there may in some cases actually be a physiological function still remaining. For instance, if the eye were responsible for something other than vision, let's say it was also the site for the production of an important chemical for the body, it might be true that a tiny vestige of an eye in a cavefish could be totally useless for vision, but still adequate to produce that necessary chemical. Knowing that many organs have multiple physiological functions like this, it should not be surprising that some vestigial structures may retain some physiological function, while others might be perfectly useless.